So let me just fill in a couple of more blanks about exactly what it is that I do. I missed most of the Knowledge Cafe. I went to a nice dinner uh, a couple of buildings away and uh, with a number of the faculty members from here. And what I do is basically little data. And that's sort of the role. So Ryan Womack, my counterpart at Rutgers, also does little data. Now, some of the data sets that I deal with, they are in the many, many terabytes. And a few years ago, this would have been unheard of. But nowadays, that's not even considered big. It's still big for libraries, but it's not really what we're talking about. But part of what I'm going to talk about tonight, in addition to big data, is little data. Because I think libraries, for the most part, are just getting into this. And a lot of the skills are the same, but there are also a lot of different challenges. So coming back to sort of what I do. So economics and finance, probably everybody gets that part. And obviously, those are fields that are very data driven. Princeton University was one of the first universities to establish a data center on its campus. And there's a slide later that talks about others. But um, from, the, from the beginning, which is really the early 60s, uh, Princeton has been in this game. And uh, for the most part, most universities really start doing this kind of on a bigger scale in the 80s. And libraries, for the most part, stayed out of it. They played a very small role, and that's changing. And so ICPSR, which is the world's largest social archive, um, every two years they have a conference. And at this conference, they show who actually serves the role of helping people with data. And it used to be it was all things like the politics department, the sociology department, maybe computing on campus. But it really wasn't libraries. Those tended to be rare. Nowadays, it's over 60% that it's in the libraries. And so that, I think, is a very encouraging role because, one, it means jobs for us. And that's always a good thing. So, what do we collect? Very similar to the types of things Rutgers would collect. So we're largely collecting social, political, economic data. Now, it was mentioned at the beginning about CPANDA, the Cultural Policy and the Arts and National Data Archive. So there are a lot of small archives out there that uh, try to collect data in a specific field. And in this case, CPANDA collects arts data, cultural policy data. So ICPSR was doing sort of the traditional social sciences, and no one was doing art. There was someone doing religion, there was someone doing environmental, and so what CPANDA does is it collects art data. Um, hopefully in the not so distant future, there will be an announcement that there will be another place taking this over. Uh, if our lawyers and the other places lawyers can ever completely work out the deals, but it's a really good because uh, I don't really have time to do this, and yet it's something that I've kept going uh, as a volunteer for quite some time. And then, as was mentioned, I'm also teaching at Rutgers. So what are we going to talk about tonight? We're going to look at some examples of big data in the data knowledge workshop. Uh, some of you came up with a really good definition of what it is, but for those of you that were not there, I'm going to give you a couple of definitions, and particularly one that I like from McKinsey Institute. We're going to talk a little bit about big data events. We're going to look at two major studies, one that came out of Europe and one of them that uh, came from McKinsey that looked at uh, really a lot of things. I mean, the, the main thing it looked at was how could data play a role? What should it be doing? And I'm looking at a little piece of that, which is what role should librarians, uh, information scientists, play? As I said, we're going to talk about little data, because that's still kind of largely what we're doing. And then we're going to talk about uh, the thing that's taken over our national election, and all of us are obviously very interested in also, and that's jobs, because most of you will be um, if you're not currently working, you will be graduating in the not so distant future and you're going to want a job. And this is an area that there are a lot of jobs. We're going to talk about what are the skills that may be needed in order to get these types of jobs and what library schools, information schools are doing or thinking of doing. So the next few slides, uh, I am the world's um, least creative person. So all of these are stolen. Uh, essentially, they're attributed later, but uh, they're basically taken from a great McKinsey report. And what they did is they talked about 
um, just some examples of big data. So one of them was, uh, it used to be the big concern was about cost. It was so expensive to store data. That's not the case anymore. So nowadays, for $600, you could buy a disk drive that would store all the music in the world. $600. A little while you're going to see what uh, the first computers cost, which are less than a calculator today uh, in terms of what they would do. 60% of the world's population has mobile phones. Now, if you do the math, you know that um, that 60% of the world's population is not 5 billion, but of course, many of us have multiple mobile phones. So what's happening with all that data that's going out there? Um, probably everybody in the room except I maintains a Facebook account. And um, every uh, month, there are 30 billion pieces of content that are shared on Facebook. And that number is probably even higher since this report was done. And then I think one of the uh, interesting trends is that while the cost is going up very little, 5% a year, the amount of data being generated is going up 40% per year. Library of Congress, as we know, has begun uh, collecting big data, but they also um, have their traditional collections. And it's estimated that if you actually were to digitize everything, it comes out to about 235 terabytes. And that seems like a lot of data, but in reality, it's not. 15 out of 17 industries in this country actually have more data uh, per company than the Library of Congress has all of its holdings over time. And then, of course, everything comes down to money in some way. And so a lot of why people are so interested in big data is what could it do? It could help with marketing. It could identify new markets. It could eliminate fraud. There's a lot of different uses for it. So we know that the fastest uh, growing segment of our economy in terms of cost is healthcare. And they estimate that by using big data properly, that we could actually have a value of $300 billion a year. Likewise, um, in the government sectors, and the example that they used was Europe, that um, if they just used the data more creatively, then you could reduce uh, national health care expenditures, but you could also reduce a lot of the operational costs, the administrative costs of doing government. You could also reduce fraud, errors, tax gaps, many different things to identify new revenue streams using what's currently there. And that could um, come out to about 250 billion euro per year. And there are other examples. Now, the main thing, of course, we're all interested in is we want jobs. And even if we have jobs, we want new jobs that pay even more. So um, the, the big thing that, to me, came out of the McKinsey Institute report was that there is going to be a large shortage of people. So we're talking about right now, in this country, we have an unemployment rate of a little bit over 8%. But this is an area that there's going to be growth. So they estimate that um, we need about 140 to 190,000 more people with deep analytical skills and one and a half million people to actually manage the data. So that's a lot of jobs. And as I said, all these were taken from the McKinsey Global Institute, Big Data, the next frontier for innovation, competition, and productivity. And this report was from June of 2011. So, here are some examples of actual big data. You know, Facebook again, I mentioned, you know, we know this. Everybody in the room, as I said, except I, has a Facebook account. And so 901 million active users. Twitter, over 500 million registered users. Uh, every day, over 340 million tweets. Uh, over 1.6 billion search queries a day. So, yes? So we just added, so it's now 340 million one. <laughs> okay, so hashtag LIS502 if you are tweeting. 
So why do we care about this? As I said, I'm actually a person who um, I don't really think terribly highly of social media for the most part. There are some great things that have come out of it. Um, and certainly, um, most recently, um, a lot of the reporting that came out of the Middle East. I mean, that was a really good use of social media. I think a lot of it's not the greatest use of time. Um, but that's because of the way that people are using. But at the same time, think about the information that's going out. This could be of great value to companies. The problem is, is what do you do with the 340 million tweets daily. And that's really the heart of big data. So of those 340 million tweets, probably 339,900,000 serve no purpose. But there are ones that do serve a purpose. And they have important information about people. And how could that be used to come up with new markets, to identify trends that are happening and so forth. And that's really why people care. It's not just the volume, it's the information that's contained within. And of course, there's privacy issue, there's lots of other things that we can talk more about in Q&A. Um, now, in the academic community, the scientific community, the sciences have verged on big data for a long time. And in some areas, they really have been using big data, as opposed to the social sciences where something like the census was big to us, but in reality, compared to big data, it wasn't that big. But there's a new telescope about to uh, begin operating in Chile. And the estimate is that they're going to be able to capture 140 terabytes of data every five days. And this is obviously something that uh, is going to greatly advance science. So this is a good use. But then how do you deal with all this data that's coming in? Walmart, over a million customer transactions every hour. And that's taking up uh, over 2.5 petabytes. So again, you have these customer transactions. Sometimes they're linked to an individual, sometimes they're not. But if I could go in and I could see, oh, this person who just bought toilet tissue and this and this and this, how do all the people make these decisions? And again, so you could help with inventory. You could help with trying to target things. You could help with, I get a generic ad from CVS and everybody gets the same one. And they send me a lot of products that I'm not interested in. I don't buy these things. But if they actually start being able to mine my data, then they could have much more targeted ads and again, make better cells. I mean, that's what it's really all about. Uh, one of the best uses that I've seen is Bing, um, is actually looking at actual flight and price records. And so uh, there are over 225 billion of these transactions now. And you go in, and I love to travel, and I travel a lot. And so I, it goes in and it says, hmm, you're thinking of traveling between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And it looks at when are the prices based on historical, based on where I'm going, based on all these transactions. And it says, you may want to wait because historically prices are going to go down in another two weeks. So that's of great value to me. Uh, Princeton University, where I was at, was one of the uh, big partners in the Human Genome Institute. And, um, when it was originally done, it started around 1994, it ended in 2003. It took a decade to actually analyze the three billion base pairs. Now, we're almost a decade later. You can do that same thing in a week. So basically, if you start looking at all these things, what it's saying is that something that used to be almost impossible, now it is because space is cheap. We're starting to have the computing power to look at these things. And there's still a lot of challenges and we'll come to those. And we know that digital information keeps increasing, and right now it's tenfold every five years. And just the sheer amount um, is in exponential numbers. Now, every day, I belong to a lot of listservs, but um, I get news of so many different conferences. And um, it used to be they were largely library related, but now more and more, it's the big data, and it's showing up everywhere. And they're all over the board in terms of the types of topics. Some of them are very, very technological based, but an increasing number of marketing based. 
uh, IASIS, um, which was mentioned in the introduction, is the main social science data group, and Ryan and I are both members of. And this came off of their page, and it was just a few of the ones that they were alerting its members to. So let's talk about little data. And this kind of shows how we've gotten to the point where big data is now possible. So Judith Rowe, um, Judith Rowe is, is one of my heroes. Judith is, um, was the data librarian at Princeton from its origin um, until um, the late 90s. And so she served at Princeton for over 30 years. Judith was considered the top expert on the United States Census. Every time there was a new census, she was on Capitol Hill testifying. Uh, Judith did many things that enabled us to get to big data. So some of the things that she worried about early on when no one else was, everybody else was worrying about, well, how do I read this? You know, how do I manage this? And Judith worried about things like preservation. Uh, if you don't save the data, no one's going to be able to use it later. So Judith did a lot of things. And Judith was one of the, uh, I believe Judith was the second president of IASIS. And um, when I came to Princeton um, in 1993, Judith was actually the only name that I knew. The only name. I mean, there were some faculty names I knew. But I mean, in terms of the library and the OIT staff, she was the only one that I knew. And so um, Judith, in 1999, gave a beautiful speech, which you can get to freely. And at the end, there's, um, there's a bibliography called The Decades of My Life. Judith was born in the 1930s, and she related events in her life to how computing has changed. And so um, I took little tiny pieces of this just to um, highlight some things. So 1947, the transistor. So essentially, we're beginning with computers as we, not even as we know them, but sort of the early stages of computing. Two years later, magnetic core. 1953, IBM announces their first real computer, and then obviously other companies start to follow suit. 1960s, and this is not adjusted for inflation, the big computers, the Cray and the Stretch, cost around $8 million. And it had the capacity of a simple calculator today. And it was $8 million not adjusted for inflation which the students in my class can all, of course, adjust for inflation. Um, so, but at the same time, there were some companies that were thinking about this and saying, you know, no one can really, not many places can afford $8 million. So they were looking at cheaper alternatives. And so there was a company that came up with a computer that for $8,000, again, not adjusted for inflation. It had 32 kilobytes of memory. So this slide is probably more than 32 kilobytes of memory. And that was $8,000. So mid-60s, uh, we have time sharing. That's really important because it means you can use, uh, multiple people can use things, and then they can also use multiple computers to try to generate a bigger thing. You start having uh, the first programs, the first big platforms. So BASIC, when I was in high school, I learned BASIC. Uh, Unix, which uh, still uh, is one of the big platforms today, not as big as it once was. And then you start seeing a lot of the major statistical programs that are born. So you have data, punch card, but people need to be able to read this data. So you have SAS is born, a lot of programs that have died, but you do have the first ones that are coming out so that people can begin to interpret the data. 1962, um, ICPR, the S is added later, so originally it was in, uh, the Consortium for Political Research. It started with eight institutions. It's hundreds and hundreds of institutions today. And so they began collecting social science data at University of Michigan with the thought, you know, we really need to share. We can't be in this by ourselves. Now, as of 2000, we used to, the census uh, from the 1970, 80, 90, and 2000 census, we did one in 10 samples in order to find out more details about people. 2010, of course, our census did not ask the detailed questions. Uh, we used the American Community Survey. But in 1960, they did have microdata, but because the processing was not up to speed yet, 
they did a one in a thousand and a one in a ten thousand public use sample. So very small samples. And to make matters worse, of course, well, it was punch card, that was the standard, but they had the household records and they had the person records, but there was no way to link them. So today, we have the person, we can link it to their family, we can link it to the town that they live in and so forth, and many other things. Back then, couldn't even do that. But this was still a big boom because for the first time, we were getting major data. Now, as I mentioned, Princeton was one of the early places. And so you start seeing universities say, hey, you know, we need to do something with this. So they start forming uh, local data services. Uh, so Princeton, Northwestern, University of British Columbia, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, University of Wisconsin, Yale, they all form data centers. Um, luckily, all of these are still going. And of course, at this stage, most major universities have a data center of some kind. But the other thing we start seeing are the first large scale surveys, and many of which we still use today to determine people's um, income statuses, how social programs work, uh, things about unemployment, et cetera. So the current population survey, the panel survey of income dynamics, the national fertility surveys, which were actually launched at Princeton, the national longitudinal studies of labor force participation. Uh, meanwhile, in Canada and Western Europe, they begin with election surveys. You start seeing those out. The American national election studies was already in existence at University of Michigan for our own country. So we're all getting into the little data field. Now, of course, back then, that was considered really, really big data. Continuing through our path in time, um, next thing is Intel uh, forms the microprocessor. That's obviously really important because now we're speeding up uh, what we can actually do. Um, the way that we store things starts getting better. It gets smaller. It gets less cumbersome. Um, the American Library Association finally says, hey, you know, people are doing things with data. Maybe we should start making it findable, cataloging it. So they formed a committee, like ALA always does, and uh, they came up with rules for cataloging mas machine-readable data files. And so AACR2 um, added Chapter 9. It had all those recommendations in it as to how one should catalog data. And ICPSR, which is now in its second decade, uh, is just exponentially expanding as to how much data is coming out. 1980s, we have supercomputers. We start having household computing, uh, the Mac, uh, you know, the PCs, all its clones. And now electronic mail existed before, but it starts becoming more widespread. And most importantly for academia, uh, it becomes available in the academic community and remote logins. This really changes the way that people can work. So this becomes standard. Likewise, uh, we keep coming up with better and better devices in terms of how much uh, information can be stored. So the 90s and 2000s, more of the same essentially. We keep um, the price of computing keeps coming down, how much we can store gets better, the devices get better. And then of course, we get to the 21st century. And really, it's in the mid um, decade, uh, first decade, that we begin to see things such as um, social media really exploding. And companies had been having all of this data, but they really didn't know what to do with it. They didn't have a way to store it. And then now you start seeing companies like Walmart and many of the Costco and so forth saying, we have all this, we're capturing all this information about people, what can we do about it? So I mentioned there's two big reports that I'm gonna give you uh, baby summaries of. So the first one came out of Europe and it was called Compilation of Results on Drivers and Barriers and New Opportunities. And it's an 86-page report, and I'm just going to give you a few highlights from it. Um, they also did another report parallel, the same committee, that talked about data citation that went on for about 100 pages. And um, you know, even I think that's a little bit too much. So um, this one, however, talks about a lot of things. But the parts that I'm going to focus on is what role do they see libraries having or not having? 
and they talk about both little data and big data. So um, here are some quotes from it. And again, this was a European commission, so there are a few things that are going to be mentioned uh, that their structure is a little bit different than the way we do things in the United States. So some supported the view that libraries could and should play an increased role as data managers and experts on the basis of their traditional role as pri providers of information management professionals. Others were more inclined to see the role of the library as at the most one of an intermediary between the researcher and the data centers that would be able to provide the highly specialized support researchers would need. Not a whole lot of difference between the two statements, but one of them sees us being as much more active. One is saying, you know, it's kind of more your traditional reference and so forth. You help them find. Um, and I'm hoping, obviously, that we're going to play the first role, that we're going to play both roles, but we're definitely going to play the first role, which is also to help and the organization gathering everything else. So more of these quotes. Um, essentially, this one basically says you know, that we, um, we're very good at uh, letting people know how to find information. And um, however, they are not seeing that li um, library schools are playing the right role in being able to um, to train people. And so, um, yes, you're teaching traditional reference skills, but the skills are very different. They're very different for little data, and they're certainly different for big data. Another quote from this report, um, and the one that I thought was the, the main word in this was specific discipline and data requirements. And so one of the big arguments is um, that, yes, there can be generic standards, and there does need to be, but there are certain things that are really going to differ vastly by the field, and so that it's not enough to just know the structure that you're going to need people that are experts in the actual subject area. And we had a little bit of talk about this at um, dinner that I was at right before this, and uh, one of the things is, are you in a large organization where you have lots of people to draw upon, subject experts, computer people, et cetera, or are you just starting with this and the one person has to do it all, and one person do it all? More stuff saying, hey, train people. All right. So a lot of the things that they felt that we could definitely do, and there was little doubt about, was working on standards for how we describe the data, metadata, as well as how to cite the data, and how to ensure that people in the future will be able to actually find it. Now, we know that for a long time, the standard in libraries has been the MARC format. And um, places continue to catalog in the MARC format. Uh, there are some um, changes this year that have come about with RDA. But does either one of these really do a good job of describing data? Because data is very different. So there's so many things that you need to know about it. And even if we're talking small data, little data, compared to big data, so how do you really describe it? And, but what they are saying is that, you know, this is something that librarians traditionally do. So we actually think that um, you could come up with the relevant standards to be able to do this. You could come up with the mappings. You could come up with some standards that cut across fields. Yes, there will be certain things that only certain disciplines will do, but there are a lot of things that you could cut across, and that's where uh, they feel librarians could really uh, come in. Um, now, if we're cataloging a single data set, or a book, or a journal, that's pretty straightforward. We give it a few subject headings, we give it a few lines, we're kind of over a bigger, um, a little data set, the census or something. Ideally, we should talk about the variables that are there, the sample size, and so forth. But what do we do when we're talking about big data? How do you describe every tweet? You can't. What do you do? What are the things that we need to be able to pull out? Is there a way to structure it as it goes in so that later the data is going to make sense? And then something we all care about, obviously, and researchers should, is, um, you know, is how to cite. And I find, in general, data tends to be really badly cited. Um, when we're lucky, people actually tell us the data set that they used. 
Often they don't even do that, or they mix and match, or they will say, according to the World Bank, well, from what from the World Bank, or according to the Census Bureau, and often we can figure it out, and sometimes we cannot. So again, you know, you have to have standard citation rules. I don't know if um, any of you saw this, there was announcements that um, the same people who do Web of Science is going to have a, um, a product new that's going to include data citations. Um, when you look at what they're including, um, it's somewhat limited, but it's a start. So it's at least a step in the right direction. Um, I always love, you know, the government issues pearls, persistent URLs, but they break every year. So they're not terribly persistent. So we really need, and there are standards out there. Uh, there's DOIs that work pretty well, but we need something that's going to do. And we also have to know the provenance. Essentially, we have to know where this originated. We have to know the versions. Version control is really important because when you're working with data, I'm doing one thing, someone else is doing something else. And I had conclusions based on as of a certain date, it changes. And the next person says, well, your results are not accurate. Well, maybe they were as of that time. So we have to not only keep um, the latest, but we have to really keep past versions also. And we have to be able to clearly identify. Uh, they talk a little bit about service providers, that uh, we need well-funded data centers. Well, we need well-funded libraries, too. But uh, so the same thing goes, goes with that. Uh, but we also need people who have been, again, trained to do so, the standards. We need to be able to work with the publishers, um, et cetera. Now, one of the things to mention is they talk about uh, the well-funded data centers. And in our country, um, <coughs> things tend to be either at a university, a corporation. Uh, we do not have a true national data archive. So the National Archives archives some data, but it's, it's select in terms of what, the, what it does. And whereas if I go to the United Kingdom, I go to Germany, I go to Australia, they have national data archives. And again, they're not archiving everything they can't, but they are archiving the things from the government, typically things coming out of universities and so forth. And we're not centralized like that. And so I think in many ways, Europe, Canada, well, Canada doesn't either, but Europe, Australia, they're a little ahead of us because they have centralized things and things are done at a national level. So the McKinsey report, um, this one's 156 pages and it was called Big Data, the Next Frontier for Innovation, Competition and Productivity. And um, this one, if you Google it, you'll find it and you just have to register. So I didn't include a URL because I actually found it several places, but you do have to sign in. But it's actually a really great report, typical McKinsey. The only difference is, is usually a McKinsey report, we normally can't get our hands $10,000. And this one is freely available on the web um, with just registration required. And what they do is they do a series of case studies to look at different industries and what are the potentials for them. And I'm going to just briefly touch on that. Now, everybody has definitions. Um, I thought actually the definition that was come up with in the workshop right before this was quite nice. But McKinsey says, big data is a data set whose size is beyond the ability of typical database software tools to capture, store, manage, and analyze. So this is basically saying SAS, SPSS, data are probably not going to cut it. They are subjective. And what they don't talk about specifically is how big. And the point that they make is what's big today is not big tomorrow. And we've seen this with other things. So something that we have a hard time handling today, two years from now, may be easier. But things are just going to continue to grow. So they don't really do it in terms of size. They do it really more in terms of whatever the tools are at the time, can they handle? Um. This one uh, says is two things. One, the amount of data that's being produced is growing exponentially, that we know. But the other thing is that we have gone uh, from an analog world to a digital world. And I think that's no surprise. So if you look at the amount now, it is largely digital. They look at how much data is being produced. And this is two years ago. 
but if you take together companies and consumers, we're talking 13, over 13 exabytes of data per year. So we are talking enormous amounts of data that are being generated. And just to give you a comparison, uh, they compare it to the Library of Congress. Just one exabyte is more than 4,000 times the information stored at the Library of Congress. So do the math and you'll see how much is actually coming out. Now, needless to say, space is cheap, but we cannot store it all. And even if we did, what will we do with it? So that's really the big thing is, what do we store? And the stuff that we store, why are we storing it? What do we need to store? And what do we do with it? And how do we read it and make sense of it? Otherwise, if all we're storing it is to store it, there's no point. Um, it said, by 2009, nearly all sectors in the U.S. economy had at least an average of 200 terabytes of stored data per company if they had over 1,000 employees. So basically, this has become the norm. Almost all companies, even if they're just keeping small things about their company itself, their records, it's growing exponentially. And almost every sector of the economy, data has now played some role. In a little while, we'll see that it does differ greatly. Um, so how can we create value with big data? Transparency. So if every single thing is documented, it's a little bit harder to hide what you're doing. So whether we're talking things such as tax fraud or um, you know, any type of cheating so that you can actually, if you, you're exerting every single transaction and we then have a way to go back, then it's going to be harder to hide things. Um, so that's one. Um, better ways uh, enables experimentation to discover needs, expose variability and improve performance. So again, if you look at all the different um, possible combinations of things, and you analyze them, maybe you'll find ways to be more efficient. Maybe you'll identify new markets. So really that's what it's looking at. The segmenting population, obviously again, we have some things that are doing that pretty good job already. So Netflix, I go in, it says, oh, you know, you really like The Wire. So we think you're going to like, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but overall I actually think their recommendations are kind of pretty good, a little scary in fact. Um, Amazon, same thing. You know, you go in and uh, they look at, now, I, I think librarians are perhaps a bad uh, case perhaps because maybe we look at too many things. So um, I find my Amazon recommendations are actually not as good as my Netflix recommendations because my tastes are sort of all over the board, whereas my movie tastes are a little bit uh, more specialized but my, my reading tastes really kind of are all over the board, so I do get a lot of doozies, but I have a lot of friends who think, wow, you know, these really are the things that I largely uh, feel I should be reading. Um, replace, support human decision-making with automated algorithms. Well, that's not a bad thing necessarily. If it frees up time that uh, we can and using to actually um, you know, make intelligent decisions and we're not doing just number crunching, that's not a bad thing. Um, and obviously innovation. Most of this report is given to these case studies and I'm not gonna um, really spend much time on but they talk about um, the potential value uh, per year in each of these sectors. So US healthcare, over $300 billion a year. Uh, public sector administration, so essentially the government, um, you know, 250 uh, billion euros. Uh, personal location data, uh, up to $700 uh, billion value to end users. So uh, a lot of the stuff is the tracking and so forth. So you go in and you know it tells you everything from the closest coffee shop is um, to you know where uh, you're looking for a restaurant, and it gives you this information. And so all of this, obviously, we're already using. Um, U.S. retail, manufacturing, so they give these different examples and they go into great detail as to why we really should be using big data to make big decisions. So obviously not all industries are going to be equal and so one of the things that they also look at in this report is who has the potential to gain the most from it and essentially um, you want to be on the right hand side of the screen um, well, these are the ones that have the most potential. So needless to say, the information industry, because that's the whole thing, finance and insurance, healthcare, government. 
So probably no real surprises there. Likewise, the ones that are probably not going to gain so much from construction, you know, I'm not really sure exactly what it would gain, but uh, they have it at the very bottom of the scale. And so some of these, they're basically saying, you know, there's just less to gain from. And, but uh, if we think about, you know, again, healthcare, finance, insurance, real estate, um, and information defined broadly, these are probably the areas that we're uh, most likely looking at. And the big thing that I got out of this report, even if it just constitutes about five pages, uh, but it's the part I cared about, was they said, hey, there is a shortage of talent necessary for organizations to take advantage of the big data. And that's really why we're here. Come back to that slide I showed you earlier, again, you know, they're saying 140,000 to 190,000 people with deep analytical talent needed and one and a half million uh, data managers. Now, this slide, what they talked about was what are the types of jobs that they looked at. And they looked at different industries. And uh, first I did a quick read of this and I thought, oh my, you know, I don't see librarians. And, but then I looked a little bit more close and they do have information scientists, so I'm gonna count that. But um, the deep analytical, that one we probably don't play as much of a role and these are the people who have advanced training in statistics and our machine learning and conduct data analysis. We could play a role, but I don't really see that as our primary role. Uh, there's the big data savvy and there's the supporting technology. So the supporting technology, yes, a lot of it is programming and so forth, and that's certainly something that we can play a role in, but I don't really see that as our primary role. I really hope that we fall much more into the big data savvy category, the one in the middle. So people who have basic knowledge of statistics and or machine learning and can define key questions data can answer. So I don't necessarily think that we will be the ones that are saying, you know, you're a doctor, this is what you should know. But I think what we can do is to help the doctors or the whatever the group may be, the finance people say, here's how we can get to those questions that you really want to answer. This, here's how we can organize this information. Here's what we should be keeping. So I need to get out of this for a second. And all right, I'm going to skip one and just go ahead. So I, I had been saving um, different job ads that I saw, and. Um, and then what I didn't think about was often they provide just the link, and as soon as it's filled, it goes away. So I lost some of my job ads that I had, but then I thought a lot of them are kind of repetitive anyway. So um, if anyone from any of these institutions happens to be watching, I have unbelievably simplified job ads, uh, and I've condensed categories and so forth. But what I really kind of wanted to look at is what are the things that they generally tend to ask for? And many of these are what we would consider fairly um, little data jobs. Um, largely universities, again, because those are the types of jobs that I'm largely seeing on the listservs that I belong to. But there was Columbia, Michigan, another Columbia, Johns Hopkins, uh, Wisconsin, Yale. So I use these as case studies because um, when I started looking at more, they kept repeating the same things. So for the most part, uh, almost every one of these jobs asks for, except for the first one, asks for at least a master's degree. Now, not all of them were MLSs or MISs, but most of them were asking. Um, very few were requiring a PhD but almost all of them were requiring at least a master's. Now, experience, I mean, it depended on the job, obviously, as to what it was. Obviously, a management position is going to require more, but many of the others did not. But if you can see, uh, 4.6 years, four, four to six years related, eight plus, no experience, three plus, uh, but they would look at your combination of education. Same thing with this one. This one did not require experience, so each one had. This one I combined a lot of categories, and this is one that kept showing up over and over. 
and they'd phrase it different ways. But one of the big things they said is you've got to understand the data life cycle. Some of them actually said you have to have participated in the data life cycle from beginning to end. So that would mean perhaps um, I did a survey and then I analyzed my survey and then I wrote an article or a chapter in a book about my survey. So I've really made it through the process and then ideally I then took this data and I gave it to a library or I gave it to an archive. I ensured that it was preserved. Uh, very few of them required you to go all the way through, but they did say you have to at least understand what are the steps. And that's certainly something I think we're uh, teaching in uh, the programs. Um, you had to know about repositories. Some of them said data repositories, some of them said institutional repositories. They weren't necessarily saying you had to have experience in, but you really had to understand what they did. Again, this is something I think that's being taught. Data curation and archiving, um, they, they want you to know about it. They realize that you may not have had much experience in it, but it's something they want you to at least be familiar with. And if we go across the board, you know, they're all mentioning something like that. One of them I thought um, that was mentioned that I thought was interesting was, you know, they really wanted you to have um, budget experience. And, um, you know, even with collection development classes, I think that's often left out. And, um, but essentially, you know, you're going to manage money in some way. So if you can know that, that's a good thing. Metadata, well, this is kind of the heart of, um, you know, of what we do in um, LA. So um, they weren't necessarily saying that it was required, but highly preferred. Um, this one had a yes. But certainly, you know, if I look at the broader scope of job ads, um, metadata is a pretty standard thing, and this is something obviously that we do tend to teach in schools. Stat packages um, or GIS, some were requiring, some were not. But again, if you're going to do research or you're going to manage data, uh, obviously that's preferable. Um, outreach and public service, very few of these had uh, sort of a teaching component, some were a little bit more private. My personal opinion as a librarian is you should always have good outreach skills, uh, public service skills, because even if you don't have a, um, a public per se, um, you know, whether it is students or you're in a public library, you're going to have a public. Your public will be the doctors that you're working with or the scientists that you're working with, but you're definitely going to have some type of clientele. The one that every single ad pretty much had something about um, was you know the play well with others. And so this has nothing to do per se with this. I mean, you, you can go across almost any job ad, but again, that's as important. And so um, I know in, in the class that I'm doing this semester, every time we have a break, it seems like my entire class is talking about all the student organizations they're involved in and so forth, and mainly that their budgets and so forth, but they're, they're playing well with others and they're having leadership positions. And this is definitely something that's important. So um, this talked about that you're going to work across organizations. They also talked about that you need the analytical and communication skills. The other one that came up a lot was project management. Because again, you're going to have to be able to control amounts of data. You're going to have to be work with others. And you're going to have to be able to plan something across. And so most of us are not going to get real data management, project management skills. But there are other ways to demonstrate that you have project management skills, whether it is running a student organization or doing a lot of group work in classes, um, you know, perhaps things in your personal lives. But it is something that's often asked about and um, just kind of completely getting off the topic. But just when you, whatever your job is, this is going to be a very regular question that you're going to get in job interviews is to give an example of how you've managed a project. Uh, to talk about teamwork that you've done. The teamwork part, usually that comes easily. People can think of things that they've done either in their personal lives or in school or work. But the project management, usually you kind of have to think about that. So just be prepared and have an answer uh, because I guarantee you all of you have managed some type of project, even if it wasn't in the workforce. So have something that sounds intelligent that you can talk about. Um, you know, authoring websites, whether it's XML, et cetera, uh, cascading spreadsheets. So a lot of them do talk about those things um, because often you have to do other things, even if that's not the main part of your job. 
Uh, with the visual, tech, uh, visual technology, being able to actually have visualization tools, this is one that comes up with more and more things because more and more people think that way. And so they want you to be able to not just have a spreadsheet with a bunch of numbers, but to be able to make it make sense to people. Um, indexing, cataloging, uh, online research skills, um, some of them mentioned, most of these did not, but a couple of them did specifically mention. And the, the one that just always gets me is for academic positions, the snootier the institution, the more likely it is to be required, and that's foreign languages. And um, I personally think uh, there's more important languages that you need to know if you're doing this. So you need to be able to speak the language of data. You need to be able to perhaps know computer languages. And I think those are much more important. So even if I'm fluent in Swedish, how is that going to help me with French or German or anything else? So um, there are obviously positions out there where that's crucial, but um, I think they need to look much more at the other types of languages that one has. So let me go back to this. So to sort of, um, in summary, the ones that we see a lot, there's the ones on the left-hand side of the page that pretty much any job ad, um, regardless of the field, is going to ask for. The analytical skills, the communication skills, project management, budgets, uh, you know, and the playing well with others. But then there are the ones that are more specific to, uh, to data, and whether we're talking little data or big data. And that's that you have to be able to understand the research data cycle, repositories, data curation and archiving, metadata standards, have some familiarity with the stat package, even if you're not an expert in it, at least know how to open a file and maybe do a basic regression. Um, and the other thing that not many of these ads has, uh, but I, it seems like every ad I see these days, except these, seems to have um, that part of your job is going to be helping the faculty with National Science Foundation and National Institute for Health proposals. If you have any desire whatsoever to be a librarian in the sciences, medicine, I guarantee it's going to be part of your job. And I would also venture to say that in many of the social sciences, uh, it's just a lot of what we do these days is helping to advise and no one really knows what they're doing and the standards are still pretty vague and I think one of the things that maybe we can help with is helping come up with more concrete standards. So what's happening with library schools? Well, library schools are starting to talk about this and a few of them are actually uh, gotten a little bit past the talking stage. So University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign uh, they created a data curation track focusing on scientific information back in 2006, and two years later they added the digital track. Uh, Simmons, uh, like most schools, is really just at the beginning stages. They decided that n rather than make it part of their curriculum, it would be a certificate because they figured there's a lot of people out there who already have degrees, but they need new skills to be able to do the new types of jobs that are out there or the way their jobs are changing. So they did a post-master certificate, and so that was just launched. Um, at Jenner, I was uh, talking, and I thought, okay, at first I thought, well, do I mention other library schools? Is that sort of evil? And, um, and then um, I was uh, told by a certain person in this room who has a pretty important position that, um, that um, I think you actually use the word worship, but uh, Syracuse University. So Syracuse is, <laughs> so anyway, Syracuse actually um, does have two well-established tracks. And one of them is um, in data science. And I know it's kind of small, well actually it's bigger up there, mine is really small. But uh, the different classes that they have, and they have two required classes, only two data administration concepts and database management and applied data science. And then essentially they have different tracks, visualization, analytics, storage and management, systems management, and then you choose electives, you know, so sort of a standard program. And then they have another track uh, called information innovation. And this one is dealing much more with social media and things like that and uh, the way things are changing. And uh, things in red are classes that were offered in both tracks. 
So there is a lot of crossover, um, needless to say. So information architecture for internet services, managing information system projects, creating, managing, and preserving digital assets, enterprise technologies, data administration concepts and database management, and advanced database management. These were the classes that cut across both programs. Now what that says to me is if I was in one of these programs and I was choosing my electives, not knowing where I would get a job, I may want to make sure that I have ones that cut across programs to ensure that I would be able to be more versatile. Um, Rutgers um, has formed a task force. There are several faculty members um, who are now uh, seriously talking about um, how they can respond to this. And um, perhaps during the Q&A session, we're going to start in a moment, um, some of the Rutgers faculty can talk a little bit more about this. But I went through the curriculum, and um, there are actually many, many classes that you could easily plug in that you're already offering that would clearly fall into this type of thing. Organizing information, metadata for the information professional, information technologies for library and information agencies, information retrieval, digital libraries, information visualization and presentation, database design and management, digital library technology, social informatics, understanding designing and building social media, and there are others also. So I think you already have the basis for a lot. So I guess the next piece is to really look and say, well, what's missing? And I know that that's what the task force is looking at. And then you, like Syracuse did, the different tracks. Here's where Rutgers is going to focus. My guess is you'll probably try to pick a niche that is not as well covered, perhaps at other places, so that you can have your selling point. And, um, you know, and then there'll be electives and there'll be required classes and so forth. But, you know, it's nice to see, and, I guarantee, and I'm pretty sure that if we would have looked at this five years ago, probably half these classes didn't exist. So, um, you know, certainly curriculums are changing. And even if the program's not there, many of the classes that you would need, these types of jobs are there. It's just there isn't an official track yet that's called that. Uh, I want to give a uh, shout out to Ryan. Um, this is a slide that was added this morning. Um, I'm on the Rutgers listserv because of the class I'm doing, and so I thought, okay, I'll add this, and then I couldn't fit it, so I had to chop a lot out, Ryan. But if you're interested in these, uh, talk to Ryan. Um, so R is an open source um, program uh, for um, statistics, and um, he's having a three-part workshop series uh, introducing R, and then there's, once you've done these, or if you already have the knowledge, uh, there's a more advanced one that you can take. And then he's also doing two introductory classes to two of the proprietary programs. Uh, SPSS is very heavily used um, in the social sciences, and uh, it's been around for a very long time. SAS is very heavily used in the healthcare industry and in business, and so he's having classes for these. And the um, thing that was, I thought was really interesting was you don't need to register. Uh, it's first come, first serve, but then I was told at dinner uh, that they are very popular, not by Ryan, Ryan was not at dinner, so um, by Nancy, that they're very popular, and so you really want to make sure that you're there early because you do not want to miss these classes. This is going to give you really important skills, whether you decide to go into the data field or not. So how many of you are interested in going into academia? So if you're in academia, part of your job is going to be to publish. You know, you don't get to keep your job if you don't publish. So you've got to do research and, um, do, and things like that. If you go into um, a corporate, you know, a special library, um, often, um, if, if the library is still there, you're often the only person there now, so you're asked to do a lot of things. So, and obviously, if you go into the data fields, knowing these packages is important. So, um, so turn to Ryan for these things. Um, I have where I grab my various slides and some of my thoughts from. So there are some various readings that you can look at, and. What I want to do now is stop with my boring PowerPoint presentation. And I really want to open it up, and I want to hear what are the types of things that you are, I do have, thank you. 
Um, so I want to hear about what are the types of things that you are thinking about, what questions you have, but also, you know, how do I get into this? Uh, what types of questions do you have? So, first question. Good, I get to go home early tonight. All right, <laughs> Bethany. <laughs> Okay. Well, obviously at this point, the classes you've decided to take is what you're going to have. So unless you decide to spend a few more semesters, that's not going to happen. But I think one thing you can do is read, 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 uh, because often it's going to be, I mean, yes, the ideal is always real world experience. Second is a formal class. But at least if you can intelligently have a conversation about something, so maybe you can say, you know, I, either the class wasn't offered or unfortunately I wasn't able to fill into my schedule, but I've read from these experts on this and these are their thoughts. So, I, so that's one thing. The other thing is if your statistical skills are not as great as they could be, and that's probably most people, um, then I would say, um, you know, go to, at least to the R workshops perhaps. Um, I. Um, I think those are really important because it's going to, if you can learn R, honestly, you're going to learn the others. And the nice thing is whatever institution you go to, um, they're going to have different things. They may have paid, they may not, but since R is open source, that's really going to um, open up your world. So that's one thing. Um, for those of you that are not quite as far along in the program, obviously there are classes you can take, but the other thing is internships. You know, if you can find an internship, that's, um, that somehow deals with this, that's great. Um, I don't know, like, do you get to have interns, Ryan? It's something that we're thinking about. We, we don't have any research data interns at this okay. point, but I think it could develop into that. Okay, so petition Ryan um, <laughs> that you would like to work for him for free <laughs> in order to get credit. So um, unfortunately at Princeton University, um, and now that this is being broadcast, I'll, I'll, I'll really say it because I'm really unhappy with this decision. Um, we used to have interns all the time. And um, a decision was made that Princeton no longer has interns. And I really, really hope that that will change uh, in the near future. So I've actually done quite a few internships. And I've done a few that were on the econ finance side, but I've done a few on the data side. And they were always win-win situations. Uh, the student learned something that they did not know before, and I had new things that I could point to, or I was able to be helped with things that either I did not know how to do, or I didn't have the time to do. So as I said, I'm really hoping Princeton reverses that decision. Uh, but for other places out there that may not um, you know, have such stringent policies as to who's allowed to enter a building and work, um, you know, seek out those opportunities. So, yes? So, Jeff Stanton at Syracuse read through a lot of the job ads mm -hmm. uh, and said that they nearly all specified a degree in computer science. Mm -hmm. And he was complaining that the high school basically didn't have a recognizable brand in this area. And he didn't actually have an answer. Um, I do not. <laughs> so the question was, um, when Syracuse was forming their program, they looked at the ads, and so many of them required computer science degrees. And, um, and this kind of comes back to the conversation that a few of us had at dinner. If you're a small organization and you haven't done this yet, you're going to hire one person. And that one person, the first thing they're going to look at is, I need a programmer to be able to extract this data. But if you're at a slightly larger organization, you're going to have, I mean, almost every place has, you know, even if it's a one-person system staff, they're going to have someone that hopefully has these skills. And so I think it's, you know, it's really convincing organizations, convincing people that uh, this is what you have. Now, of course, how do you get into a job interview if the thing required and someone is screening that isn't even willing to talk to you? That's challenging. I mean, you can uh, some organizations will be more flexible, and if you can have a really great cover letter and really talk about how, yes, you don't have a degree in computer science, but you have all of these skills. Others, 
Uh, someone who knows anything about the job never sees it. It's an HR office that's really just looking at uh, you know, qualifications and everyone else is thrown in the trash. So it, it really is hard, but I think the key is academia certainly requires different things. And I think the larger organizations, and maybe that's where you know, traditional library people will make their breakthroughs. And then later, once we show, hey, we really do have something to offer, then maybe the smaller places will start taking us. And along those lines, I, I began by saying how much I don't like social media. But I think the one social media uh, thing that actually can work is LinkedIn. And so, um, you know, if you, I have to say, I still haven't completely filled out my profile, but, uh, but uh, if you haven't done so, you know, join LinkedIn. And uh, I'm not sure in libraries, per se, how much people are looking at that yet, but I definitely know an industry. And I have, I have a lot of friends who uh, largely do project management, who do consulting and so forth, and they get jobs, and people are finding them that way. And again, it's, you know, it's exactly what was just said. They're looking for certain skills that are out there, and they're looking for, and so the more specific you can be, the more your profile is filled out, unlike mine, um, you know, people will seek you out. And it's not necessarily just jobs. I mean, it can be, like in my case, speaking engagements or consulting or other things. But um, people do look through these things, and they're finding people that way. So LinkedIn is, um, I think, a really good way. Networking, you know, I mean, that's the other. It's, um, I, I go to conferences, and yes, you know, sometimes I learn things. But more often than not, that's not why I'm at the conference. It's those personal connections. So in my case, it's being able to call the data library in Finland and saying, Tomas, I need this. And I'm a real person, as opposed to just you know, an anonymous person on email. So whether it's the student organizations that you're in now, one day these are your colleagues, not your classmates. Or if you can attend an ALA, an SLA, uh, a local chapter of the SLA, if you can't go to the national, um, you know, anything's like this, you're gonna meet people. You're gonna meet people if you go to the local SLA. You're gonna meet people in the pharmaceutical industry. You're gonna meet pe people that work at Dow Jones and so forth. And you know, who knows, maybe they're gonna be hiring. And you know, it's someone you can talk to. So other questions? Okay. Okay, that's a good question. So the question was, what are the things that I read uh, in order to keep up? Um, so um, I'm going to make a plug again for IASIS. Um, IASIS is the International Associ Association of Social Science and Information Service Technology. Is that right? Yeah, I can never remember what it stands for. But anyway, it's a great organization. And it is the cheapest membership out there. So um, I, don't, I don't think we have a student rate, do we? Right, there's no student rate, but it's $50, and um, they never seem to go up. So um, this is a great deal, because one of the things is for all of you that are paying the student rate for ALA and SLA, boy, is that going to change once you become a professional. The rates really will go up considerably. ISIS, it's a flat fee, and it's a great organization, and you get to meet people from all over the world, and so it's really nice. So that's a really nice one. So what do they do? What does ISIS do? They have a journal, just like you know, most associations do. It's called IQ ISIS Quarterly. And there's, uh, it's free. You can read it online. So if you just do a Google search for ISIS Quarterly, you'll find it. Uh, they have conferences, like most places do, obviously. And um, our conference is once a year. We actually get to go to neat locations. So we alternate between US, Canada, and Europe. Uh, even though there's talk about uh, going to the southern hemisphere. And you obviously don't have to go every year, and obviously not everyone is able to do that. But if it happens to be in your part of the world. Uh, but the main thing is the listserv. 
And I know a lot of people that have never been to an ISIS conference, but they find, and they don't even post, but they read because they learn. And so it's a great listserv. People send out questions, and um, you know, just like a lot of the others, and uh, often you get back answers from other parts of the world, different approaches to things. Um, you know, there is a lot. There is um, obviously job ads that are posted there, but also announcements for conferences, different things that uh, metadata workshops. You know, different things that you could go to. So that's a really good one. Um, I would also say. Um, kind of the softer end of computing. So um, you know, if you can find journals that you can get through the jargon, um, and even if it's just things you know, that are very simple, like PC Magazine and so forth, I mean, just kind of keeping up, you know, at least with technology. But there's also things like, um, I think it's actually still called online. Um, but things like that, just to kind of know what's happening out there. Um, so anything like that, I would say, you know, that you can do. Um, the uh, Ryan and I are both representatives for the New Jersey State Data Center, and um, it does um, workshops um, once a year. There is a conference that's always held at Rutgers, and I don't remember the cost of it, but it's not very much. Basically, it's the cost of lunch, pretty much. And, um, and there are people from the Census Bureau each year that comes, and people from different agencies, and they talk about things. Um, there's also groups, not necessarily that they're always about data, but things like the Documents Association of New Jersey, uh, because data plays a big role in government documents. Uh, they will often talk about data on uh, different things. And uh, this year's, which is November 2nd, um, Ryan and I are speaking together at this. Um, so none of this is actually planned, but anyway, it's. Um, th there are a lot of ways, I think, to keep up, and not all of them you know, really cost much money, and some of them don't cost any money. So I think that's, um, but it's important to keep up, and then likewise, it's important if you're not really quite in the field, at least to have some role in just by keeping up with what's happening. So there's a lot of things that I don't really do. Um, I don't really catalog, but you know, I will follow at least the major articles that are showing up in some of the fields, because I kind of want to know what's happening with RDA and stuff, even if I don't do it, uh, because it makes me be able to talk to my colleagues, so when I ask them to do something, I know what's possible or what's not possible. So I think just kind of reading broadly is good. Yes? Um, one of our online students wanted to know, his name is Pierre Rosen, he wanted to know, did you have any thoughts on how public libraries can take advantage of big data? Um, okay, so the question is, how can public libraries take advantage of big data? Um, I think it will be a little bit more challenging at first. Um, and, the, the, and I think they're the ones, actually, that could benefit the most in the long run. I think right now, most of them tend not to have the infrastructure in place. And so that's a little bit harder because public libraries, I don't know of any public libraries that actually do little data. So, um, so big data is sort of that next piece. But if you think about you know, mining social media, mining uh, all the records that are out there and so forth, um, I don't know. I mean, does, do members of the audience have thoughts on that? Ryan? I mean, there is the movement Yes. And so sites like data.gov mm -hmm. um, that are making available large data sets, being able to point people to those sources and say this is what's out there. Right. Here's, here's an example of how you can make use of it. The public library itself may not be archiving the data mm -hmm. um, themselves, but they can guide users to it. Okay. I, I, have a, I have an additional answer. I think one of the things that we should be doing is even if we're not the ones creating the data or archiving the data, I think a large part of our job is to help people understand what it is that they're looking at. So I think any librarian out there who is just saying here, unless quite frankly there's a line of 20 people and that doesn't happen often anymore, you know, part of your job, even if they won't read it, part of your job is to say, here's the methodology behind it. You really should read this to understand it. And any information that you can give to add to that is helpful. So rather than just saying, you know, here's your thing, here's where you can look to find more information so that you can make a better decision. And that's not the same as interpreting, but it's, it's at least saying, you know, you can make a more uh, informed decision. So <laughs> other, yes? I'm really glad that you brought up SLA, Special Library Association, because there are many academic librarians who belong and 
How many of you are, I know many of you, um, at least in my class, like everybody is active in some student or association, but in terms of the professional ones, uh, how many of you are members of SLA? Okay, so I would, I would highly encourage you, while the rates are dirt cheap, to uh, try it out. You know, you probably can't afford to go to the conference, perhaps, but at the same time, you know, you'll get newsletters, you'll get things, their listservs are really good. You're gonna see a lot of job postings, if nothing else, because nowadays, very few people post job ads in actual publications. Uh, it takes too long and it's expensive. So the listservs are the way it's at. How many are members of ALA? Okay, so a lot, so that's, that's good. So I, I'd say while it's cheap, you know, also perhaps can delay. Um, and, and as was said, SLA is not just, you know, corporate librarians. There are a lot of academics. There's not a heavy public presence, but there are some public librarians I know that are active in. And, um, and I think they're complementary organizations. And there are obviously some other organizations that are a little bit more specialized that could be useful. You know what? <coughs> Folks who are looking at academic libraries might also want to look at EDUCAUSE. Okay. EDUCAUSE has a library of mm -hmm. technologies constituent group these days, and is getting, which is getting more active. Traditionally, EDUCAUSE was the, the techies only. Right. That's, that, those lines are crossing. Okay, so um, EDUCAUSE, and the only reason I'm repeating things is I'm not sure if anything picks up for the people out there. So, um, but EDUCAUSE is another organization that we should consider and um, that it's not just for techies anymore. And I know I have a couple of my colleagues at Princeton that do go regularly to EDUCAUSE. So other, yes? Can I ask the group uh, two questions? One is, if we were to offer a course in big data analytics, how mm -hmm. much would we be interested in taking it? Mm -hmm. How many have had a stack course at some point in life? How many would take the regular stack course here? Okay, and then I put out a notice on Alyssa about a workshop on Monday morning that Sam O is going to do. You guys see it? have classes, conflicts. How many of you wish you could if you didn't have another conflict? See, that's the thing. <laughs> All right. Um, Dan, maybe you want to talk a little bit about our test course since uh, Bob Ray mentioned. Yes. Our test course on uh, big data. All right, so the articles that Bob Ray mentioned, we've already studied those. We've compiled a Sakai website and an article came out today uh, that we just added to our site called uh, big Data, a Big Opportunity for Librarians, was published in the September-October issue of Online. I think that a very good summary of what's going on is by Laura Gordon, her name, she here is going to recommend a reading list of bibliography courses and what's going on with that bibliography. So what our task force has done is we've tried, we've done an analysis of what's offered in all the other schools. said in the high school, they simply required two courses and then add to that some of their existing courses and call that a specialization. So two of the things that our task force has considered 
is making this a specialization in the MLIS program. And that was, uh, idea was agreed to by our faculty last Wednesday, and that uh, proposal is sent to our curriculum committee, who I hope will decide on it by our next October faculty meeting. Uh, and then the second thing we're considering is a certificate program for uh, academic librarians that we would hold here. We would offer uh, concentrated mm -hmm. courses for people like Bob Ray to teach me and cheat and the charge of all this. And others of us would also teach. So that's pretty much it, Marie, in terms of where we're at. This was Marie's initiative last summer. Uh, it's a very good initiative, and uh, we're really hoping that we can uh, put a dent in it. And what we're kind of calling it is, right now, Big Data Curation and Management. So that seems to be the working title that mm -hmm. we have at this point in time that could change. Michael Lesk, I don't know if he wanted to add anything about it. Uh, well, one of the, frankly, big questions we have, Dan has started to address, which is, what level of literacy or computer skill ought we to be looking at? Uh, this is the same question that I discussed with people from Syracuse. Uh, if you think that big data involves some subject skills, some computing skills, and some archiving uh, data handling skills, um, are we teaching one of those as we now do? So in your, so I have a qu uh, question for you about the second program, which is the academic track. Almost every job ad in a large university library that I see today that involves either a social science or a science, data is more and more written into them, and it's a requirement. However, data is just part of it. And I view it you know, the same as, you know, we don't say, oh, I don't touch you know, paper journals or I don't touch, you know, data is just part of what we do now, but you have to understand the subject. So I think there's a role for the data services librarian in terms of coordinating all these people, in terms of looking out for the areas that no one does, because there's gonna be gaps that don't really fall into any single subject area or that no one wants to pay for, or everyone views as just someone else's. And then there's all the things that are really more on the service side that aren't really about the subject side. So it's, you know, it's the, um, you know, the statistical packages and really uh, understanding the organization of and so forth, as well as helping the subject librarians who know their subjects understand this new, f not, not that it's a new format, but a format that's new to them. So, if I'm going to be an economics librarian or I'm going to be a, a biology librarian, foremost, I really need to understand my topic. So what are, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I have a degree in those areas. So that the average person entering library school, we're talking about this coming in, you know, came from a liberal arts background. So what will you do in this program for the person that ideally would like to be a science librarian but had an education background or a literature background, but they have the curiosity and they really want to know. What if they had a business background and an MBA? Right. Well, if they have a business background, they're already they're they're set in a certain area. Uh, but and you know, and again, I mean, the part of the thing is, you know, we need more people with the business backgrounds, with the science technology backgrounds, but we know that that's not the majority of the people. So how do we get people who don't have those backgrounds to be able to credibly answer questions, to be able to converse with faculty? Because I guarantee you, I can know everything about data. If someone comes into my office and they start asking very specific questions about economics, and I have no clue, not to say that I'll know everything they're talking about, but if I have no clue what they're talking about, they're never gonna come back because as far as they're concerned, I'm useless. And, you know, I mean, th there's the whole argument about the generalist and so forth, as opposed to the subject specialist, but what do people do when they don't have the backgrounds, but they know that there's not many music librarian positions anymore or literature librarian positions, 
that the ones that people are asking for are the ones that there aren't many people in libraries with those backgrounds. One thing that uh, is interesting is uh, Bob Gray sent emails to Nina Wachholder, mm -hmm. which she sent to me, and then we downloaded all the jobs that you sent her. Right. And we did our own separate analysis of the jobs in the academic libraries. Uh, the conclusion that Ming Young and I came to was that, uh, at least I did, 10 years ago, our students would have had no problem with the analytics because they yes. were required to take a methods course, a quantitative yes. statistics course. They all took it. I don't think anyone, maybe one person a year had real trouble. Everyone else who mm -hmm. thought they were going to have trouble didn't. They passed the course. That course could be modified to move toward uh, big data curation. And when we dropped that requirement, very few students then elected to mm -hmm. take statistics because they thought, how could this relate to a job as a librarian? But it turns out that course, those students 10 years ago would have no trouble moving right. into this. So I'm hesitant to say to a meeting like this that I would love to require the statistics course again for you and the people that come after you, but I do want to do that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this has been a really nice presentation mm -hmm. about uh, the uh, positive aspects of this big data and uh, uh, the possibilities for working in it. Uh, suppose I were to ask you to give a slightly different thought, changing only one letter. Uh, what's the bad deal about big data? Okay, so uh, before this, before this, there was, and as I said, I just went to the very end of it, and so I missed almost the whole conversation, but they were having this nice conversation, and they had defined big data, and they were talking about uses for, like, marketing and so forth, and I decided, all right, let me bring up something that's actually more fun. And so I said, you know, tell me about the evil aspects, and I think that's really your question. So there's a lot, and so let's go back to small data, little data. So one of the things about little data is that whenever you have a public use file, the data is always anonymized. So obviously there's no names, there's no social security numbers. Geography tends to be stripped, at least fine geography. So the census is a little bit different in that we do have fine geography, but then there's enough that you can't quite tell. It's not 100% true, but uh, there's enough where you can't quite you know, get these things. And, um, and certainly the detail wasn't in the census, it was either in the one in 10 or now the American Community Survey. So with little data, I can get access to people's, and I do every day, and not just me, but my juniors at Princeton, forget grad students, my juniors are working with people's health data, their education, their test scores, all of these things. Now it doesn't say that it's Marie versus Bob Ray versus Nancy, but it does have, you know, there's a lot of information there. But again, there's precautions. And then the finer the layer of data you need, then you have to go before an institutional review board. And um, they make you uh, one, I mean, do testing and stuff, which is pretty simple. But then you sign a lot of things, and there's scary phrases in it, like, you will go to prison. <laughs> Uh, you know, you will pay a $50,000 fine and go to prison. Your advisor will go to prison. You know, talk about scary. Like, now that you care about your advisor, maybe you don't like the guy, but your advisor has to sign it too. So, uh, so there's a lot of protection. Perhaps not as much as some would like, but there's a lot of protection. So when we're talking big data, um, you know, I'm always surprised. So I mentioned at the beginning that I'm not the greatest fan of most social media. I am shocked constantly. So we talked about LinkedIn, where, you know, at least it began with a way for people to network professionally, and more and more people are adding about their personal lives. Well, let's face it, what is Facebook? It is about your personal life. And I am shocked, quite frankly, all the time at how much people are revealing. So what do employers do these days? They go out, and they do a search for you, and they look at your Facebook account, and they say, hmm, even if they, they're not your friend, you can still get certain things off of that front page. And they're looking at this, and they're thinking, this person who's going to represent me is bragging about, pick a topic, that really is nobody's business but yours. So think about that before you put. 
Now, this is on a very small scale where they're looking up an individual. Now, the obvious, uh, uh, the, the extreme is Big Brother, where the government, you know, or somebody like that is looking at all of this and they're targeting and they're saying, and there have been examples uh, in places that, you know, this has been used for. So religious data has been used to target people, to identify people. The United States government has not asked any religious questions on any of its surveys since 1940. There's a reason for that. Uh, their, the Netherlands has not had a formal census since, the, uh, since around 1972. And again, it was out of fear of things that had happened previously. So again, there are really bad things that could happen if people take the stuff and they start using it to you know, either stereotype, to segment uh, portions of the population, to quarantine portions of the population. Uh, so that's the government. Insurance companies, health companies, employers, they can say, um, you know, assuming that the laws don't change, well, pre-existing conditions. I see this person, you know, uh, you know, once fought breast cancer, I'm not going to cover them. Or I'm not going to hire that person because they're going to write, you know, make my insurance costs go up. So there's, there's a lot of, you know, kind of scary potential. And um, likewise, um, you know, maybe it's a good thing that Netflix knows that if I watch The Wire that I may be interested in this show. Okay, and that's just kind of fun and I go in and actually get decent movie recommendations. But then suppose they start sharing those things with other people. And you know, on the, the, the annoying scale, I get more junk mail. But potentially, um, you know, they could start taking that stuff. Uh, we send out credit card information all the time. You know, we pay most of our bills electronically. So depending, you know, if it does fall into the wrong hands, obviously it could be used for <coughs> nefarious purposes. And so that's part of the thing is how do we protect this data, yet take the pieces that could be useful to make better marketing decisions or scientific decisions. Um, kind of related to this is in this past Sunday in the New York Times there was an article on the environmental impact of these huge mm. data centers. Mm -hmm. Like how they you know they use like two percent of the country's electricity yes. every year and um, so I'm wondering is this something that's on the radar of you and your colleagues or is that kind of like separate to go to like maybe the um, I think it's something we should be aware of. It's not something that we've talked at all about, but I mean, I know in general, I mean, universities are certainly, uh, and research centers are certainly looking at how can we conserve energy. Now, yet largely they're looking at, you know, how can we save on the light bills and so forth. But you're right. So, um, so it is something probably that we should, Ryan. I'll put in a plug for Princeton yeah. here. There was a conference about big data at Princeton last mm -hmm. year of the new Princeton data center and actually having things in the data center, that's the place where they, you know, there's so much energy at stake that they take extreme measures to you know, conserve energy. So they have vents that open up right. when outside temperature is a certain level so that they can use other air <laughs> they can I'm about to pass out, but anyway. <laughs> if you look at the total amount of computing power used, better that it's done in the data center than your right. PC that's just sort of left on all the time. Um, I can just add a real quick piece. The Livingston campus has a large uh, solar panel farm, and now they're mm -hmm. adding in the parking lots solar panels above all the cars. So we'll mm -hmm. in 10 years we'll be generating $36 million for the wow. solar energy that we will use at breakfast. Uh, energy that we're now paying for some reason we can't sell back to the grid, so we can limit on how much we can generate. But we're, we're going to be way ahead of other folks. That's great. Um, maybe, maybe one more question. Okay. So. There's an online. I think there's, oh, there's an online. Okay, so what's our online question? Uh, Miranda Ward wanted to know, and this is going back to the issue of public libraries, she wants to know if public libraries might be hesitant about big data due to privacy issues. I would say all libraries. Uh, so the question is about would public libraries be hesitant because of privacy issues? And um, you know, I would actually argue that you know th that's something that all libraries are concerned with. And um, you know, again, uh, something that came up at the dinner. We should have had everybody at the dinner, <laughs> but um, 
but anyway, you know, this did come up is about, um, you know, how do people deal with and so forth. And, um, you know, do people even trust librarians? People are scared that you're going to discuss your, uh, you're going to give away their dissertation topic to someone else. So in general, they're, you know, I didn't, to me, like libraries are the people that you would trust, but perhaps not. But I would say that if you look at the things that libraries in general do, we tend to purge circulation records. So yes, we know how many times a book circulated, but as soon as it's brought back, we take that person's name off. So we do deal with things. The data that we will tend to get as a library, whether it's a public or academic, we're generally not going to get the full data set we're going to get some anonymized version of that data set. Certainly if it's an academic or public library, we're normally not the ones generating. And so in those cases, um, it's going to come back with the name stripped, perhaps their address stripped, you know, any social security numbers, student IDs, things like that. So usually that's going to be taken care of. I would say it's really more for the places that are actually generating. So whether a university that's taking all this data or you're the corporation that's you know generating these uh, zillions of transactions on Amazon or you know Netflix etc those are the ones that really need to be careful that they're not giving away um, you know private information about people <laughs>